The Metis Tech Show. Welcome to the Metis Tech Show, a show for HVAC professionals by HVAC professionals. The Metis Tech Show. Yeah, this Fourth of July was no fun. This was uh, <laughs> we had uh, fog. What do we have up here in New England, Paul? Fog. We had, you know, fog. We uh, had well, thunder, lightning, uh, rain. We yeah. had um, miserable humidity. Yeah, I went camping Friday and Saturday. I stayed in a hotel. Yeah, my kid stayed in a tent. <laughs> I stayed in a hotel. And and I opened the the curtain and I looked out the window. There's cranberry bogs in behind. It was you know it was near the Cape, and uh, could not see the parking lot, which was five feet in front of the window. It was just looked like somebody frosted the window. I couldn't see anything, uh, but it turned out to be a nice day. Um, Saturday and Sunday, um, the group I was only going to stay there those two days. The group I was with was going to stay till Tuesday, but everybody left Sunday because then. Right afternoon, the rain came and it came and it poured and it was thunder and lightning and uh, yeah, I was home by then. So, so how do you go camping and your kids in a tent and you're in a hotel? How does okay. that work? Um, I used to love camping when I was younger, but um, the U.S. Army ruined camping for me because when you go camping in the army, it's nothing <laughs> like you do, like you see. And not, no, it's just it's horrible. It's not Cub Scout camping. So, yeah, I wasn't about to sleep in a cot outside. Uh, the crickets keep me up. So I stayed in a nice, comfortable hotel, had my breakfast. And then uh, these group of people that were staying in tents, my kid was in a tent with a bunch of other kids. And I showed up in the morning with a box of coffee, and that was it. That's that's wow. camping for me. It's pretty smart, actually. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I used points for the hotel. These hotels were going four or $500 a night. It cost me nothing. You didn't have to wake up feeling like a snail like you usually do when you go camping. Yeah. You get that yeah, wet, no. nasty gross feeling no it took, but, a, took a hot shower that didn't have a cement floor didn't smell so we have no, we, so. we have rick powell who's um coming in to us uh from georgia right now and rick how was your fourth, fourth of july how was the weather it was rainy um oh so you had rain too storms. yeah yeah we had rain it did clear up i did not go to any fireworks last night but we did have them it cleared up long enough to do that yeah I had a, a fireworks show in Sandwich, Mass. on the Cape Saturday night. It was a little foggy. You know, it was funny. The first few rounds of fireworks that went off were kind of obscured, but then it burned off really quick, but it was fun. Uh, I think we've only had one weekend. Memorial Day weekend was the last weekend we had that didn't rain. Yeah. You know, yeah. Anyway. So it was, it, was, it yeah. was a pretty awful 4th of July um, compared to the usual 4th of Julys that we have, you know, the cookouts going on and stuff like that. I, I just did, hung out at home and did you smoke a brisket? I ribs? did. I did smoke a brisket and I went on Facebook and asked everybody, you know, fat side up, fat side down. Oh, That's the big up. debate. Fat side up. Um, no, you can't. You can't do that. Then the fat That's, doesn't the fat seep into the meat? No, no. no, no. no. So Depends fat on where the heat is. Right. Exactly. You put the, you put the uh, fat side on where the heat is. Now sometimes the heat because it rises up and bounces back down on top of the heat. You know, it's not, you think as the heat being underneath it, but it's not really. I, I think of fat as flavor. So Ed Blair right. responded in, in my post and he he totally blew my mind with his uh, fat side up, fat side down thing. Um, fat and water don't mix. A brisket is a muscle. It's full of water. So you don't want fat dripping over the brisket. There's no point. Hmm doesn't mix so fat side down but there there again like rick said it depends on where the heat's coming from in my particular smoker it's a pellet smoker so the burner box is underneath it's right up against the the fat so i want the fat on the bottom yeah either I, way it I came know. out amazing it broke apart you know had a nice little had a nice elasticity to it um it, it, it was it was really good i'm gonna trust you because i haven't been involved with smoking anything since high school Oh Jesus! Okay. All right. so, so what temp? What temp did you cook it to? Um, so two twenty five, and I went to about eleven hours on it. It was about an eight pound. It was about an eight pound brisket. 
Is there any brisket left over? Yes. And you didn't bring any in today? I, I, well, uh, yeah, that was, wow. Yeah, I can't okay. believe I did that. Right. Uh, so what uh, internal temp? What internal temp of the meat? Uh, it was around 190-ish when I was done. Because I did something a little different. I bought some brisket, <clears throat> and it was in a bag, and you cooked it in the oven in the bag. Oh. Kind of like the turkey bag. And um, it wanted to cook to an internal temp of 145 which I usually cook brisket to 190. Um, that's the first time I'd ever seen that or that I've seen cooking it in a bag. Yeah. But it was good. Oh, right. Yeah, it came out. It, I, usually, I mean, I don't think I've ever messed up a brisket. Uh, it usually comes out really good. Well, you can mess up really easy ribs and stuff like that to me anyway. I think, uh, anyway. But welcome to the Metis Tech Show, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about something that we had to get out really quick we're getting a ton of mhk2 controllers being returned um on warranty and we want to just touch base on why this is happening and um today we have rick powell coming to us from swanee georgia once again rick is with us yes and we have paul shaves senior uh, training manager for metis and myself steve pimental technical training manager for for metis yeah and this is going to be just a quick Short podcast, it's just going to be a short, we're going to talk about the MHK2, the weight issue, and then uh, that's it. So this will be a quick one, not a regularly scheduled podcast, just a special short. Yeah, so so we had the MHK1 uh, for a long time, great go-to controller, very popular all-around uh, controller because it's easy to set up, it's wireless, right? You just can't beat um, the simplicity of this controller. The connection process moving to the MHK2 same connection process. You press the connect button, the controller connects. You have um, now actually it has a countdown. It'll show you what's happening. The, the flashing green light uh, will show you if you're connecting, um, how, how the connection is going. Um, and it's just very simple to connect. Yeah. So, what um, is the issue we're having with the MHK2? What's the reason for this podcast? W- so, there's a weight screen. Yeah. Right, so this is this is it can be very ir- irritating, um, especially when that weight screen doesn't go away. So I go to connect it, I follow the procedures to connect it, and the screen on the MHK2 says wait. Nope, not necessarily. It'll connect, right? Well, let's let me back up a second. Um, is the system in error? Is the system wired properly? Is the system addressed properly? Right. But These be- are the things we're going to talk about. If n- if all of those things are correct. The connection process is simple and right. it connects the first time. What what contractors are seeing uh, is one of two things. They're not getting through the connection process um, the first time because the system is uh, in error or not wired properly. Or they're getting through the connection process, but somewhere along the line, they flip the disconnect and shut off power. Now they f- turn power back on and the controller just sits there for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Forever, right? Saying so, wait. So then the contractor will take that controller off the wall and ship it back to us, right? And saying that it's broken or it's defective, but in reality, when we test these things, there's nothing wrong with them, right? All right. So let's talk about the first one. I go to connect it, and I'm on that wait screen. How long should I wait for that wait screen to go away? I would give it ten minutes, and and this is nothing new. You know, like like you said, Steve, we had the MHK1, which was a fantastic um, controller. Uh, we actually had the same issues with the MHK1 as we had with the MHK2. Um, <clears throat> they would go to connect it. Um, it wouldn't connect. Obviously, if you're a contractor and you're out in the field, you're standing in front of the equipment, and your thermostat locks on a please wait or a wait screen, depending on which one you have, you're going to assume that there's something wrong with that thermostat, right? So that's the that's the component you're going to take back to the supply house and, and swap out. But that's not the problem. The problem is there's something else wrong in the system. There's a reason why that that MHK1 or MHK2 will not connect to its receiver. Uh, back in the days of the MHK1, most of what we had was wall mount units. We did have some ducted units and some uh, PLFY cassette units. 
the wall mounts would show a fast flash, a communication error. So those who know would know there's something wrong with the system. But if you're doing it with a ducted unit or a, a set unit or or the multi-position unit, the SVZ, the PVA or MVZ, there's no flashing lights on those units. That's a good point. So you have, mm. so you have no idea that your system's in error. All you know is that thermostat says wait and won't connect. So it's logical, right? My thermostat's messed up. So you take it back, you get another one, bring it back, and guess what? It does the same thing. It does the same thing, but now you know, hey, it can't be the controller. So let me see what else is going on. So what we're trying to do is is just educate our contractors. They get that wait or the please does it say wait or please wait? So the the MHK two says wait. Okay, so it's rude. Yes, yeah. it well, we're not, well, it's no, not being friendly. It's just telling well, you. To wait. Okay, yeah. so it says wait, right? Wait, you know, ten minutes. Go do something. You know, start putting your tools away. If you come back after ten minutes and it says wait, then we have a communication issue of some kind, and it's not between the controller and the equipment, so to speak. It could be between the indoor and outdoor, or the systems in some type of fault, right? Right. Correct. And the sad part about it is sometimes a contractor may take two of these back, you know, before. And usually what happens when he can't get it fixed the first time, you know, with the second controller or the third, then he's going to call our 1-800 number. At which time one of our, you know, he's either going to call our 1-800 number or he's going to call his support team at the supply house, which is known as our DSG, you know, Diamond Service Group member. And they're going to know, you know, and they're going to say, well, wait a minute, something else is going going on here. But meantime, we've had one or two controllers return for warranty that there's nothing wrong with. Right. All right. So we're just trying to save you, the contractor, uh, a trip to the supply house and get the job done. Right. Commissioned right from the get go. So wait 10 minutes. After you try to connect, if it still says wait, start looking at the equipment for some type of communication, yeah. uh, miswiring, uh, power off at one or the other. Well, most likely, if power is on at the outdoor, there could be a disconnect switch at the indoor. Yeah. There's the cross wiring that you could check between S1, S2, S3, make sure they're wired properly, uh, and then try connecting, then reset the power, now, turn it back on, and then try connecting again. Now, something that I've noticed with our, our equipment, especially when I'm getting ready for class, it, it, I'll take a look at, um, cause we bug our equipment in class quite a bit. Right. And then students get to fix the equipment at the end of class. So sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll have a bug in the system that maybe left from the last class. And, um, I turn the system on and the bug has been fixed. I've fixed, I know I fixed it, right. I have a high pressure switch that was disconnected and now I, reconnected that high pressure switch and I'll turn that P series unit on and there's still an F5 error code on the screen of the controller and the, the outdoor unit is still flashing even though the bug's been fixed. I notice P series tend to retain error codes a lot longer than M series do. That can do you agree with that, Rick? So th so that is correct. Now back in the day if you get a, and this is very strange with a P-series unit, you can get a communication error with a P-series unit and you can power it off for a minute and power it back on and that error will not go away. Right. Back in the day, you know, I used to have to set a clock. You have to power it down for five minutes minimum. That P-series system has to be off for five minutes minimum. What I do now is 10 minutes. If you've got a, if you've got problems and you're on a P-series system and you can't get the MHK2 to connect or you've got a fault or you had to change something in the wiring, you need to power that thing down and wait 10 minutes and then power it back up to get that error to go away. It will not go. I mean, you can actually put your meter on that system and it'll be communicating just like nothing's wrong with it, but it's still locked into that fault. And until you power it down, like I said, Minimum five minutes. I prefer to go 10. That way you're guaranteed that it's going to get out and then power it back up. And then, then that, that error will clear itself up. What if um, it, now, is there an option to clear 
the era history on a P series? I, I believe through dip switches. Can we do that? Would that be the same thing as waiting uh, with the power uh, off? I'm not, no, I'm not aware of any way to clear errors um, unless it's through a, a deluxe MA like a par 40. Okay. I don't think through maintenance mode, there's no way to clear the errors on a P series. Okay. Other than that long power cycle. Yeah. So, so it, well, we're going to wait until we cycle. We're going to cycle the, we want the contractor to cycle power long enough to clear that error code. Just remember that some some equipment will retain that error code longer. And I've been there. I've turned off the equipment to reset the error or clear the error. Didn't wait long enough. I go back and the error is still there, even though I know it's fixed. So that's important. Wait long enough. So bottom line is you're connecting the MHK2. The screen, if the screen says wait, and you wait your 10 minutes and you're still not connected, then you've got another issue. Your system is in some type of fault. Let's find the fault and then try to, and then we'll cycle power off, give it a good 10 minutes with the power off, and then turn it back on and try to connect again. If you found your fault, you should be in business. Don't don't go to the supply house and return it until you know that you've uh, yeah. Corrected everything, whatever's wrong. No, now what about the MXZ smart multi branch box system addressing it? If it's not addressed properly or was never addressed from the from the beginning, Rick, would that cause issues with CN 105 or with the MHK2? Yes, yeah, Steve, that's correct. <clears throat> uh, we, we've learned in the last six to eight months that uh, even though these systems can self address, that if they're not manually addressed it can affect the communication on the cn105 what they call the it terminal the cn105 output it can affect it if it's not manually addressed the system okay all right yeah so there we go so that's it and um i don't know if we're leaving anything out um probably <clears throat> maybe I something would, i would yeah i would say if you get yourself in this situation uh the best way to go troubleshoot is to go look at the tech videos on checking your, your S1, S2, S3 communications. If you find yourself in that scenario, if you're in a wait, go to that, familiarize yourself with what voltages and things you need to see uh, yep. and check those. Yep. Make sure on mylinkdrive.com. Yep. Yeah. So yep. we have tech tip videos. We also have podcasts episodes that we've done in the past on how to diagnose S1, S2, S3. They can yep. go back and look at yeah, and uh, let's give Rick's cell phone number, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Five five five. It's five. It's five five five. Yeah. No, we won't do that Zero, to you. Zero one two three. <laughs> no, your best your best course. If you have any questions, call your local uh, DSG member, your distri your distributor, and there's the tech support line or eight hundred number um, as well. Yeah. Right? Well, mylinkdrive.com to Rick's point. Uh, there's some tech tip videos on there on how to isolate some of the faults, check the S1, S2, S3, make sure it's wired properly. So so thank you, Rick, for joining us on this uh, uh, special short podcast. Fourth of July episode. Fourth of July <laughs> episode. Yes. Right? We can actually say that. Typically, we record these well in advance, but we're going to release this one. Yes, today's the fifth, and we're probably going to release this today or tomorrow. So. Yeah. 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 All right. Rick, take care, brother. You too. Nice to be here.